Thank you so much for being with me today on our special project, Speaking Truths to Youth. I have a few questions I'd like to ask you, starting with what event or beliefs in your youth led you to become an activist? Well, uh, first of all, I, I don't like to uh, call myself an activist. Uh, you know, as a professional journalist, I, I always saw myself as uh, maybe an engaged commentator, an opinionated observer. Uh, I wasn't marching or organizing or taking physical risks, you know, like the activists that I really admired. My background is a middle-class white person raised in an all-white, very small town in the Allegheny Mountains. Uh, shielded me from any early confrontation with injustice or inequality. My parents, uh, teachers and Unitarians, were considered pretty liberal for their day. And naturally, as like all young people, I tried to rebel against that a little bit. My early political sympathies were libertarian. And uh, in college in Massachusetts, I was anything but an activist. I'm sure that the big city guy saw me as a rustic conservative. I would have voted for Goldwater if I'd been old enough. But I always sided with underdogs, you know, in a way that was uh, more personal and emotional than political. If there was one experience that changed my views radically, it was covering the SDS occupation of a couple of buildings at Columbia. When I was a graduate student in the journalism school, I saw a police riot, you know, officers with billy clubs assaulting tenured faculty, bloody heads, broken glasses, uh, faculty who were protecting the, the students, the SDS students. And that cured me of, uh, you know, a kind of a naive small town privileged trust in government and law enforcement. And later I learned that the NYPD and the FBI had infiltrated the SDS leadership as well. That and, and my brother's very traumatic experience as a soldier in Vietnam. He, he joined vets against the war the day he returned to U.S. soil. It started me on a path toward a much more radical, skeptical assessment of America's political system and its ruling class. Libertarianism is all very fine theoretic. No one wants the government messing with our private lives. But what it amounts to in practice, when the government doesn't use its power to promote social and economic justice, is a feeding frenzy where the big fish eat the little fish about twice as rapidly as they might have. So that's, that's, that was my early evolution. I've always been engaged. Some people say enraged. I admit to being something of a pessimist. And, you know, besides the pandemic, and the global warming, this is a really frightening time to be an American. We have rich cynics and furious morons in a, in a kind of a coalition and that controls a major political party that represents nearly half the electorate and opposes uh, and tries to destroy everything that I personally believe in. Through all this, uh, you can't quit, you can't give up, because if you do, you're wasting, in one sense, I think, all the efforts and the sacrifices of the best Americans of the past, you know, all those martyrs of the peace, labor, civil rights, women's suffrage movements, those good people who stood up against power and greed and arrogance. Uh, in my case, as in many others, I, there are children and grandchildren who will be living in this country long after I'm gone. And I want them to live in the best country that we can leave them. I, it isn't so much a matter of courage, I think, you know, fighting this fight as of self-respect. You know, once you've taken the trouble to build yourself a sturdy, well-informed conscience, what else can you do but obey it? Among the activists that I've admired most and written about a great deal were the incredible Berrigan brothers, the radical pacifist priests who spent many years in prison for their symbolic demonstrations against the war machine. A quote from uh, Father Dan Berrigan, the day after I'm embalmed, that's when I'll give it up. And he asserted that not long before he was uh, indeed embalmed. And his brother, Phil Berrigan, once told me in his jail cell in North Carolina, the consequences of withdrawal are reprehensible. Silence lends assent, doesn't it? Jesus did not withdraw. I preserve a lot of hope, unquote. I, I can't match Father Phil's personal relationship with Jesus or with hope either, but I'd hate to have him, of all people, dismiss me as a quitter. What continues to motivate you or give you courage or hope? Well, I, I, I really do see you know, a lot of young people uh, who seem to me to be more 
sensible and more focused than, than most young people were when I was in school, you know, which was in the 60s, you know, and uh, we had two or three people who went on peace marches and, you know, who were active in the, in the South and, you know, and with, with the uh, Martin Luther King and so on. And we had some who were really politically sophisticated who were involved in, you know, the, the protests against the war. Basically, we were all, even those of us who considered ourselves liberal, we were all in kind of a bubble back in the 60s. I know one of your other questions is about young people. These young people are just bombarded by the world. There's no way that you can, you know, sort of hide yourself from all the things that are happening in the world now. Unfortunately, that, that's the positive part is that there's just so much information and so much connection available now compared to what there was in those days. The bad part is that so much of it involves agendas and people who are trying to promote falsehoods and disinformation. In spite of that, I, I often see young people today who know a lot more and seem to care a lot more than, than we did when we were, you know, 18 or 20 or 22. And I'm not saying they're better educated, but they're in the world more. So I was mostly involved with English poetry, you know, okay. before, before I was graduated from college. So what advice do you have for a young activist today? Uh, my, my first advice to young people who take their citizenship, their activism seriously, relates to what I said about, you know, the well-informed conscience. When, when you oppose the trans powers in this country, you know, you, especially the government, you're going to pay a price, sometimes a very high one, like the Berrigan brothers. But before you pay it, you want to make sure that the causes and the movements that you choose to support are the right ones, you know, ones that you'll never have to second guess or regret. And we live now in a time when it's much harder to be sure, to inform yourself thoroughly and proceed with confidence. The media, as I was just saying, you know, they're they're just loaded today with insidious agendas, deliberate misinformation, all kinds of greedy, nasty, fanatical forces trying, you know, to mislead us, deliberately mislead us. Social media have created a jungle of falsehoods and uninformed, harsh, strident opinion. Now, this will be controversial, but I would say to a young person, avoid them as much as you can and distrust them always. Radio and even cable television, you know where, present all flavors of racism, misogyny, xenophobia, right-wing propaganda, crazy conspiracy theories, even, you know, neo-fascism as if it were, quote, news. And it takes a lot of work to find the voices, the sources that you can trust to tell you the truth, or at least to try to tell you the truth and also to weed out the voices that are lying to you. But another thing I think is important, just remembering when I first you know, became involved in, in some of these movements, another thing to watch out for, and this, is, this comes from some personal experience, uh, watch out for if you're young and, and just coming into your political and intellectual adulthood, beware of a certain kind of charismatic leader, the kind that cares more about being the leader than winning the battle. There are quite a few of these egocentrics out there, but I, I believe that in the long run, the leaders and the spokespersons that you will come to trust are humble, patient, thoughtful, and inclusive. I, I believe that they're out there too, if you, if you look to find them. But if you get off to a false start, I mean, here I am at maybe speaking directly to young people. If you get off to a false start, one that results in disappointments and what appears to be a dead end, that's never a reason to give up and return to the sidelines. You know, as Father Phil Berrigan said, silence lends assent. Always keep questioning, keep reading widely, keep paying attention, and chances are you'll end up as a valuable contributor to the struggle. Well, I think, I think you know, besides all the, the barrage of, of current information, it's important to go back and, and read uh, serious philosophers and so on of the past, because you know, human beings, uh, you know, they, they make the same mistakes and propose some of the same solutions uh, generation after generation. I mean, I think you can go back to Marcus Aurelius and, you know, and Plato and Socrates and so on, and, and begin to see some of the ways that human beings are divided into, uh, you know, predators and victims.
and thoughtful people and thoughtless people. And I, I think that you have to try to give yourself a liberal education that makes it easier to put the current barrage of information in, in proper perspective. I mean, not everybody can afford an expensive ed, you know, education, but everyone can afford a library card. And I, I think that's very important. Thank you so much. That's really, this has been wonderful advice. I've really enjoyed talking with you. Thanks very much.